Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone for coming and to get up this early. And I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's my second uh, conference. I was here uh, two years ago. And um, yeah, I'm today the talk is Linux boot and booting fast. And my name is Paul Menzel, and I work at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics here in Berlin. Um, by profession, I'm actually a mathematician. Um, but I al was always interested in free software, and um, I'm currently active in the community of, the, of Coreboot, um, the free uh, alternative to proprietary uh, BIOSes or U UEFI firmware, and yeah, I work at the Max Planck Institute. All right, um, for everyone who wants to edit typos in this uh, presentation right away. Uh, you can clone this and uh, yeah, then um, um, it's available online. Okay, so um, why this talk? Uh, first, a warning, I'm more into x86, although I want to change it, so a lot of things are um, only concerned to x86 or only apply to x86. Um, and why this talk? Um, I was al always wondering why um, systems boot so, so slow. Yeah, you see it in all uh, every day, like your phones. You when you reboot them, it takes forever. Your TV, if you turn it on, um, even uh, yeah, and your system, of course, and you see the BIOS um, screen like for a very long time, and there's no focus on that, and that's. Uh, kind of um, strange because those systems are fast and for example if I want to, for my parents for example to have like a, a multimedia system yeah I want them to just turn it on and then um, to be readily available so that they can um, have a better user experience and can start right away and that's um, unfortunately in my experience not possible with uh, proprietary uh, firmware because the vendors and probably the customers um, don't put so much focus on it. And um, I had other bad experience, like a very long time ago, um, you all knew when you USB devices came um, into the market, you wanted to boot from those, right? And the firmware didn't support it. So you couldn't boot from those, although you had like a USB connector and it was just a firmware issue and had nothing to do with the hardware. And because the vendor didn't think, um, you deserve it, um, you couldn't get it, at least not with a lot of time. So it's a good idea to have free software in the firmware also. And the second thing, for example, currently I have an AMD Ryzen system and um, the driver in there doesn't support um, MST displays, multi-stream transport displays, which have two panels. And so when they tell you, yeah, go into the firmware menu, for example, you, you don't see anything, right? So, and I cannot do anything about it besides complaining and the vendor, well, probably already moved to the next product. Yeah, also to be more close to the hardware, right? x86, the, the promise is more, more or less for the systems um, in contrast to ARM, for example, where the device tree situation or uh, implementation is going to fix this, x86 gives you a, a common interface, I'd say. So you, that's why you can boot more or less all x86 uh, kernels on any device, right? In contrast to um, um, ARM systems, for example. And that's uh, also interesting to actually see um, that the x86 uh, model is more or less emulated by all current devices, although they more or less move to, um, to a system on a ships, right? And there is no source, um, south, north bridge, and so on. But they kind of still emulate all these old devices. So it's quite interesting to actually see how the hardware is set up. And um, to all of you who have um, seen, like Ron Minnick, for example, who, who is very active in this community, and um, all the other guys, um, they're all very smart, and um, it's really cool to meet them, although that's probably um, true for, all, uh, for a lot of free software projects. All right, let's start with Linux boot. Um, so, a lot of them I already talked about, um, but the main... Um, uh, motto is we do not trust firmware and we actually do not like it, right? To update it, you have to have this uh, flash ROM ship. Um, 
updating as, as a pain most of the time. So it would be great to have actually all of these things in the Linux kernel. And if there is a problem, you can actually um, just reboot, right? And update it. You don't have to flash anything. You reboot, and then the problem is fixed. Um, firmware is everywhere, right? Um, all devices are more or less now little computers, right? Even in the CPU, there are components which run, um, uh, which run separately, which have like small control processors or um, parts in them. And uh, for example, the management engine, yeah, on Intel systems, you have like a separate device which runs its own OS, and it was in the news quite a lot. Um, in hard drives, there's firmware. In monitors, there's firmware you can update or have to update to, to fix bugs, right? So it's unfortunately everywhere, and most of the time, although probably everyone here uses Linux, um, the system is actually not free. And the problem with this is that firmware has um, high privileges. And um, for example, UEFI, um, uh, because it boots first, right, it can set up all registers and do a lot of things to your system and, um, and um, um, mock to, to the operating system that certain things are um, what it expects, but in the background, for example, locks your key events or something like this. And the operating system, and in the Windows world, if you have like an antivirus program or malware checker, it's, it's totally um, obfuscated. It doesn't know that this, these things happening. And one of those things is, for example, system management mode. Um, it's like a way that the uh, firmware can set up handlers for certain traps, and then the operating does something, but the firmware decides, OK, we got the CPU instructions, and we know this is a CPU bug, so we, have to, we cannot run it and have to rewrite it. So the system goes into the system management mode, and the operating system doesn't know about it. And um, that's not only a problem security-wise, and there were a lot of um, uh, vulnerabilities in this regards, um, it's also a problem um, for high computing systems. And that's the reason Siemens, for example, in their um, devices, um, in their CNC devices, which have like 32 axes or 31, um, they use core boot and because they want to disable the system management mode right away because um, even two milliseconds um, delay would um, make their product or the, the, the product they work on would make it bad because um, then the axis um, and they cut stuff, um, they would destroy each other. All right, yeah, I already said it's slow, it's often buggy, it's a pain to update, it's often proprietary, and um, even if it's um, free software, it's unfamiliar code base. If we put Linux in the firmware and do a lot of stuff in the Linux kernel, um, that's the code most of us are familiar with, or not familiar with, but there, there's a big community who is familiar with it, who works on it. So in this um, regard, it, I think it's good to, to, um, to, um, to, to share this code base, right, and to, to use it. And for administrators who are familiar with Linux, um, it would be great if also in the firmware there would be Linux because they could use all the tools. And that's the next thing, right? Um, do you want to boot from Pixie, for example, over wireless? Right? Is it possible with UEFI? Probably not, because there's no driver in there, or you don't have like the command line tools, whatever. So if you actually had control over the firmware, you could boot over Wi-Fi with Pexi or do your own boot protocol. Yeah, and as I said, uh, but this also applies to Linux boot. Firmware is normally um, a pain to update because those flash shifts are small. So you want to have the firm, a small firmware image. OK, yeah, let Linux do it. It's a solution for the problems I mentioned. It's a familiar code base. That's also a big reason at Facebook I heard why they want to move to Linux boot and Google, because they have a lot of um, engineers who are familiar with uh, Linux, um, developers who are familiar with Linux. So. Um, they can improve and work faster on um, implementing stuff and improve stuff.
it's well tested. Um, let's see if I say it. Um, there's a cool um, metric for this. Um, and there are a lot of developers, for example, in, in um, EDK, which is um, the, um, an implementation of UEFI and which a lot of um, vendors use um, for making UEFI um, a firmware. GitHub shows 100. I show GitHub because they do these statistics. Um, so you see 163 contributors, right? So um, if you do it with uh, Linux, then there's an infinity sign. <laughs> yes? So the um, community is much, much bigger. Um, they can work on more stuff. There are more eyes. I mean, it's. It's not 100% proof, right? But um, the gut feeling says it's, it's good to have more developers and because you get more features and you have more eyes who have spot bugs or can review code. And that's um, the next thing. For example, with UFI, you more or less have an operating system in your firmware, right? If you look at it, it has an, has an IP stack, for example, for network. Um, it has all those drivers and so on, and more or less they re have to re-implement everything. So why not just use Linux? Um, do, you have, do you have support for Braille devices in, the, in your firmware, right? Um, for, to, to have people, um, so people can use it with disabilities or the tools they want, those Braille uh, keyboards. Um, uh, probably not, uh, Wi-Fi is not there. You would get it with uh, Linux and if there's enough space. Um, so now most of you say, well, but I want to boot my operating system, and there is um, a message for this. That's a KXEC um, system call, more or less, or the KXEC program, and you can boot an other Linux kernel, for example, with KXEC, and I also think uh, FreeBSD. I'm not totally sure with, if it's possible with Windows. I don't think so, but um, it surely could be implemented. Um, yeah. In the init RAMFS, you could put all your tools you are familiar with, and um, yeah, you just fix issues. Um, if the firmware is small and most of the stuff is in the Linux kernel on your hard drive, for example, or which you load over the network, um, you just fix issues there and just reboot. Okay, yeah, so the implementation makes, makes the firmware as small as possible. That also improves um, boot time and the attack vector move as much as possible into the Linux kernel for easier uh, maintenance and administration. Um, and this is called this, um, the boot kernel in the Linux boot um, ecosystem. They kind of uh, mimic the names of U the UEFI spec there. And you use Linux as bootloader with KXX in the user space. That was actually already a reality um, in 2001, and um, Ron Minnick, who started Linux BIOS, um, had a lot of problems um, with the cluster, for example. Um, once there was a BIOS bug, for example, which um, when you rebooted the system, and of course at the clusters there is no, um, no keyboard attached, it told you press F1 to continue, right? And for a lot of nodes that's... Uh, uh, and there was no keyboard attached. So somebody had to go to all the clusters and connect the keyboard and press F1 so it could boot and they could fix the BIOS. Um, this is actually a link. So for everyone who's interested, there were several papers about Linux BIOS. And it's so interesting that 18 years ago um, or 17 years ago, all these problems, which are still present today, were actually present back then, and it has more or less nothing has changed about it. Yeah? And um, yeah, there are some clusters here which used uh, Linux BIOS. Um, um, and yeah, so these are links. Um, when you look at the presentation, you can um, click on those. OK, so um, maybe for this, um, more or less, there was no real interest, and probably it was then also a 
hard without vendor support to actually um, support new devices. So um, the um, um, Linux networks, for example, who supported um, um, Linux BIOS based clusters, they more or less went out of business. And the big manufacturers, they didn't have any interest, and so um, they had the new hardware and everyone moved there, for example. And uh, Intel and AMD, they also um, didn't publish uh, documentation anymore, right? So actually, the hardware you own without schematics and without the data manual, you cannot do. Um, it's hard to, to, to write your own firmware. Okay, so what's the present? So another problem was back then that Linux didn't support the PC, uh, couldn't enumerate PCI um, subsystems uh, well enough. So, and the flash chips um, got too small. It was only like 256 kilobytes. So, and the Linux kernel got bigger and bigger. So uh, Linux BIOS wasn't a solution anymore. And the solution was to move the Linux kernel out of it, just have a small firmware and the so-called payload, which could be grub or file the file loader. And this would only have small drivers and load um, the Linux kernel from disk or over the, um, over the network. So, and now we come to the Linux boot project again. Um, the present is, thanks, there's one uh, advantage of UEFI, because we now have an operate, a big operating system in our firmware. The, the, um, the size got bigger and bigger. Yeah, so we actually can now put the Linux kernel into the flash ROM image um, on the flash ROM ship again. Um, common sizes are 60 megabytes, for example. Yeah. Sometimes you could even put the distribution kernel in it. <laughs> One first has to say um, that IBM also um, saw this, and since Power 8, they use something called Petit Boot, and which is more or less also like Linux Boot. Um, it's, um, I believe, on build root. Um, they built the inner ROM FS and also put the kernel into the flash ROM ship, and which is um, executed quite, um, quite early. And so they actually do this already since Power 8, which is, I think, five or six years old. Um, so. IBM moved there, um, which is um, good to know. Um, and also a lot of more things for Linux boot um, will be talked about by Chris Koch tomorrow at um, 6.30. He actually works at Google on this stuff um, directly, so he will also talk a little bit more on the user space, which is Go-based Euroot, for example. and. Um, also focus a little bit more on the Linux boot UEFI side. So what is Linux boot? So we have an image with Linux as a boot kernel and an um, init RAMFS or init RD um, user space environment which um, uh, works as a bootloader. Um, yeah, we on x86, uh, it's now possible again to use it um, due to the increased uh, flash ROM chip sizes. And um, the idea is um, to also, to, to, to uh, okay, sorry, let's back up. The, the biggest problem on x86, for example, to support a new platform is to write the chipset code. And there the biggest problem is the RAM initialization. For example, all the undocumented register writes, which um, we don't have access to the documentation. So. Um, in the UEFI case, for example, there is a so-called DEXI phase, um, um, sorry, the PEI phase, and more or less this means after this phase, the RAM is initialized and most drivers are, have run, which are DXE drivers. And the idea is now to strip down this UEFI image and extend Linux this way that it is... Uh, uh, works more or less as a new EFI driver, and then the UEFI um, um, firmware will load Linux after the RAM is initialized. So you cut down a lot of um, these components which are shipped with the UEFI, and then put Linux in there. But it's still not totally free software, right? Um, this would be also possible with U-Boot, and um, of course with uh, Core Boot 2, there the goal is to get rid of the RAM stage, which runs after RAM has initialized, and um, 
because the Linux PCI uh, code has improved a lot, put Linux in there too. So these are the interfaces Linux Boot tries to build upon or to use. And on the UEFI case, I guess Chris will uh, talk more about it tomorrow. Okay, um, there are several projects who more or less are frameworks or make it easy for you to have a user space to, um, so that you can boot actually other um, systems. And that's um, HETS, which, is, uh, found, uh, which was started by Tremel Hudson. He also, with Ron Minnick, started the Linux boot stuff, which was named NERF, um, non-extensible firmware. Um, in, in contrast to extensible firmware, because we want to have a small, um, by Ron Minnick and um, Tremel, which is now called Linux Boot. Um, so HETS more or less uses uh, some kind of bash scripts around KX, like, and I try to show a demo um, in a few seconds. Um, Uroot, it's Go-based. Um, the idea is to, because Go is so fast, to just put the Go binary in there and all the sources, and to if you execute a program, it's compiled in, in just in time. And Go is so fast to compile stuff. Um, the, uh, the advantages are if you're like a Go uh, expert, that you then also can extend these scripts um, very easily. And it's good to have these sources, right? And if there's enough room, why not put the sources in there? So that's uh, what uh, Google, I think, uh, focuses on a lot. Um, as I already said, um, you could actually also use the uh, Petit Boot stuff um, from IBM. And um, of course, yeah, use Build Root, use Open Embedded. Um, they have a lot of experience to make small images for their embedded devices, so why not leverage, leverage their um, frameworks to also make an init ROM FS for Linux Boot? Okay, demo time. Um, we tried it a little bit. Um, the graphics might not be so good. Um, so we have a seven-year-old ASRock E350 M1 system here. Um, it's, a, um, it's not a very powerful system. Um, there's a socketed flash um, right here. Um, socket is good for development because you can just unplug it and if you put a push pin on here, glue it on, it's, you can remove it quite easily. So. We have this, and um, yeah, there's an, an old SSD H A H C I um, device connected. So I just um, try to connect this. Um, so the problem is because we want to, it's still fast. Um, we probably will have problems that you don't see anything, which is more or less the goal, right? But uh, that's the disadvantage of Core Boot, for example, to present it as at like fairs or um, conferences, right? Because actually your goal is that nothing can be seen. So um, yeah, let's try it. I, um, I start it now. OK. Yeah, and now um, Core Boot runs um, the ROM stage. Do, um, Daniel, do you already see it um, on it? Okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there it will come. Um, so heads is on here. Oh, and, and that's better. So that's now the heads user space, right? Um, if you want it more fast, you can, of course, already boot the thing you want to. Right, but now it gives you a, a boot menu because you um, that's used by default and is um, better for all users, right? Which use it for the first time. So, um, what I wanted to show you, I, I mean, let's try it uh, two times. So, uh, the default boot now there are scripts which um, look on the hard drive and pass the group configuration file and um, to, to, to get the parameters for kexec and. Um, now it um, did KXEC, and um, yeah, we all come to booting fast already. Um, this will be shown later. It's, that is now the operating system, right? So 
uh, let's see, because of the time, I maybe um, show it right now. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Is, um, so if you cannot see it, so the boot kernel actually it ran in um, 900, uh, 860 milliseconds, right? Um, we come to this later, and the system D um, um, uh, is a system D um, limit where it says all services have started, finished after 1.38 seconds. So the total time is 2.2 two seconds after I pressed Y in the heads demo. And um, because this is core boot, um, and we, have, we, we can capture timestamps. And um, let's see if I can show you those. Yeah, that's a problem on this system. Um, I, I don't know how. <laughs> it's an exterminal. So I'm sorry. Um, if, if I wanted to show. Uh, um, the timestamps. I um, oh, that's a. I, I just reboot and show you the timestamps in the in our user space because we have the tools in there. Uh, one second. Yeah. So um, the the problem is even. I I have to be honest. Even if the if you had a fast monitor connected. The X server actually takes some time, so the system D um, timestamp you saw there is actually not um, is actually not um, um, valid for the user, right? It's more or less uh, five seconds. Um, okay, so let's go into the recovery mode. So we now have our shell here, right? It's it's now in in a drum FF. I could disconnect the hard drive, and this would still work. And um, yeah, we have LS, and I hope we have CBMEM, yeah. CBMEM is a core boot memory. It's a small part which core boot um, reserves from memory and puts um, console messages in there or um, timestamps, for example. Ah. OK, demo didn't work. Um, so it would, um, would be around one second for this, or 1.3 seconds. Um, uh, but console messages can be seen. Yeah, so that's the core boot messages we see. Um, yeah, the, uh, nothing for this talk now. Okay, that was the Linux boot uh, demo. It worked. I'm. And yeah, I probably won't show this again because of time reasons. But you got the idea, right? I, I counted the seconds, and it was more or less like five, six seconds. But it was no genome also to be um, to to be honest. Um, yeah, with genome, it would probably um, have taken a little bit more time. Oh. Nice. OK, now to booting fast. So that was the Überschneidung. Um, that was a good start, um, the demo for, for booting fast. So um, it's possible, right? Um, and it's strange. The system is seven years old, and um, the systems got faster and faster. And my laptop, it still boots slower than this device. So why don't customers um, want this? Um, for booting fast, um, we have to, of course, first optimize the firmware, because that's today the problem. I mean, Leonard is here and all the systemd folks. It improved a lot, right, the boot time for your OS. But you actually, it actually doesn't really matter, because your firmware is still too slow, right? On the current MSI system I have, it takes 11 seconds. Here it takes um, at least six seconds. So even if you could boot your operating system in one second, it would still be a bad experience. Um, in my opinion, suspend to RAM is, is bad. And it was actually just a workaround f for actually this problem that um, 
the boot was so slow, right? If you actually could reboot your system in two seconds or so and um, put everything uh, and um, suspend to disk would work, right? Um, people would probably not need suspend to RAM, even those who want to have their sessions saved. Uh, so, and with suspend to RAM came a lot of problems. I mean, I believe every one of us had problems with suspend to RAM on that, that's, well, not 10 years ago. It worked always right on, out of the box. Okay. Yeah, but before? Hmm? With Yeah, but when you used NVIDIA? Okay, I, I think you said with NVIDIA devices, you, you had problems. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and that's also, it, 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 it consumes uh, energy, right? So, I mean, for, for TV devices, multimedia devices, um, it's, um, there were studies if there would be a, a power off switch on all devices, you could save like two, you, you could shut down two power plants, right? Um, so, yeah, so my opinion, suspend to RAM is, is bad and um, it's just a workaround for a slow boot time. And, um, yeah, okay. so, but customers um, don't request it, I guess. Uh, more focus is on the fastest hardware and not on fast boot time or free firmware. Um, Chromebooks actually put focus on it because um, that's a use model. And um, they actually have boot time requirements that they want their Chrome OS to have started from pushing the power button to um, the browser in less than 10 seconds. And that's why they also use a core boot um, due to the boot time, but also to have verified boot. They have their own security requirements. Um, and even on servers, a fast boot time would be awesome. Um, there are a lot of firmware who initialize the RAM modules seri in, in serial. That means, um, although you can do it in parallel, and um, that means all of you who have like a Dell server or whatever, it takes like six minutes to, to reboot it. What if you could do it to reboot it in less than a minute? That's um, less than a TCP timeout, for example, a standard or 60 seconds, right? So you could, kernel updates would be much easier. And also one thing, again, to suspend to RAM, it increased the complexity a lot. All these problems with suspend to RAM, all these vendors, they now have to also test suspend to RAM. So why not put all this effort which goes into fixing and testing suspend to RAM to just improve the firmware and make booting fast? Okay. Um, there were, now let's go back to the operating system. There were efforts to booted in like less than five seconds. This was 10 years ago by Arjen van de Ven and Koke Au from Intel. And there is a um, LV, LW Linux Weekly News article. Um, the link is um, uh, in the, um, on the slide. Uh, or there is a link here. And um, they used an EPC and after the firmware, they measured it and they had to fix XORG and so on, and they more or less managed to have an auto load lock in, in less than five seconds or in five seconds. But they had to do a lot of um, work to, to get there. But it's still not the standard today. Okay, yeah, now uh, due to time reasons, um, jump over the demo. But uh, as I said, um, it's it's five to six seconds on this system was more or less uh, without patching anything um, besides the Linux kernel. Um, so what to do to get a fast system in the firmware, yeah, you use core boot or Linux boot, for example, and then you get one second in the firmware, so you have four seconds for the rest. Um, this device is actually quite slow with one second. If you use an in this case, an Intel-based system, which is not totally free because it uses um, the firmware support package from Intel, so there's a binary blob to initialize the uh, memory. Um, you actually get a boot time from 380 milliseconds, which is half of the, um, the AMD system I have here, because um, AMD open-sourced their platform initialization code, and it was more or less kind of 
um, fast de glued into core boot. So uh, there are certain things which could be optimized and which is the reason why it takes one second. Also the option ROM on AMD has to be run, which is a downside compared to Intel because also graphics cards have firmware and um, AMD devices have Atom BIOS and um, it requires the option ROM um, to be there, which is in, with Intel it's possible to, to initialize hardware more or less natively. Um, so that's the difference. Okay, in the operating system, we should need to optimize the Linux kernel, the init ROM FS, and the user space. So the distribution kernel is too big, first, which takes too long to load, and secondly, um, there are too much, um, there's too much stuff enabled, which you probably don't need on your laptop, for example, or on your desktop system. And normally, you don't switch drives and put it um, um, and want to boot different systems, right? 90% or 95% of the time, you have a fixed system with a fixed configuration. Um, so you actually don't need this flexibility which a default kernel gives you. So that's why you should, if you want to have a fast, fast system, build it yourself. There's a Linux uh, command in it called debug, which um, shows you the um, initialization time of all the modules, which um, also systemd boot chart um, um, shows you to, um, to, to see how long certain modules took. With K-probes, certain devices are also now um, 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 profiled and instrumented. And from Intel, there is a PM minus graph um, project, which um, has a script called boot graph. Um, it's a Python script, which um, traces um, certain modules with, um, with, um, uh, with F-trace. And so you actually get how long each function takes. And it's interesting how many M sleeps are in the Linux kernel, which are over 100 milliseconds. Yeah. So, but unfortunately, I think there is not much focus on this because during review or so, I would always request if there's a sleep over five milliseconds, you actually should document why in the data sheet this is needed or in the specification. Yeah. Especially in graphics drivers, um, this is uh, very bad. Let's come to init ROM FS. If you have an SSD, you can um, get, um, oh, sorry, it's off the chart, it's 53 milliseconds, which with LZ4 to decompress the init ROM FS and put it in, uh, and load it. With the standard GZIP, it was on this laptop system over 300 milliseconds. Yeah, so all of you, you have an SSD, um, adapt, um, on Debian update, Rinit, update in it, RAMFS to, to uh, in Debian Unstable, it's supported by default and use uh, LZ4 as compression. Um, make it small and put only the necessary modules in this, but if you have a static system, the um, flexibility of init RAMFS is actually not needed. So even to um, shave off these 53 milliseconds, which is quite a lot, which is like 1%, if you have like five seconds more. 300 now, well, which is, is still quite a lot, 50 milliseconds. Um, build your kernel yourself, put all the mod modules in there which you need, and then you don't need an inner RAM FS. Okay, in user space, probably all of you have heard from systemd analyze, and it has several commands like systemd analyze critical chain or blame, which shows you which services take a long time. Um, there are some for whatever reason, these numbers are not always true, I was told. So there is a systemd boot chart, which, which you put in the, on the, as your init um, binary on the Linux command line, and which um, then collects all this data differently, at least a little bit differently, and gives you a nice chart. Um, I will show it to you, uh, the time is almost over, but I will show the, you this graph in a second. Um, yeah, then, yeah, there are tools, as trace perf to, to, to profile what took so long. And, of course, the services you don't need, you should deactivate it on a standard system, in my opinion. Uh, in, in my experience, for example, Modem Manager is used, but I never use Modem Manager because I only use wireless LAN or on a desktop system I have a network cable. 
So I never need these UMTS devices, for example, to, to use as a modem. Um, yeah, you should reorder some services, those dependencies, if I have a local system and don't need, my users don't, I don't need NFS or network users, right? Um, the dependency that system, the login, the is only started after the network is up, um, is actually slowing this down. Um, so one should look into this and find solution for to um, um, to, um, to support systems which don't um, need it. So it's too general, in my opinion. System D journal has a flushing. Um, which takes long in the beginning, and currently I'm investigating how to uh, make UDEF faster. Yeah, ACPI is reality, so there's also a cool co tool called Sleepgraph to debug the kernel in this regard. And what to do, I just say it really quickly, actually put pressures on vendors, complain, support vendors who care about free software and the f uh, free firmware, who um, care about um, uh, fast boot times. Power is now also available as workstations from Talos. Um, they are resellers for older um, core boot devices. They're on newer systems, you have, part, have parts which are binary blobs, so if you are okay and want to have recent systems, um, there's Purism, who actually sells laptops with, um, with core boot on it. Um, for servers, Facebook, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, Chromebooks, Dell supports uh, updates from uh, user space. And yeah, how to improve the situation, I'm looking forward to talk to all of you in the next, uh, on Sunday, um, to, to hopefully find solutions that all users can profit from it. So thanks for your attention. Sorry for taking a little bit lo too long. Oh no, I started five <laughs> minutes late. No. Anyway, this, thanks a lot, Paul, for yeah, this interesting sorry. talk. So I'm afraid we don't have time for questions anymore, but of course we are here for two days, so you can of course ask Paul the questions in the hallway track. Yeah. So we have. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah.